Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Westgate, and I shall be running through today's session uh, on behalf of Salsa. And we're going to look at pest control, um, a really important part of, of any uh, safe system of, of food manufacturing uh, and a really important thing um, to get right on, on the Salsa audits. So my name is Paul Westgate. Um, I'm the managing director over at Veritas Pest Consultancy. Uh, we provide a field biologist visits training consultancy service for the food and allied industries. And I'm also an executive board member of the British Pest Control Association. Uh, this, 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 this position gives me uh, the ability to help shape the pest control industry, an industry I've been involved in for the last 20 years. Uh, I've pretty much done all jobs within pest control, from pest control technician, field biologist, account manager. I've run my own pest control business um, and I work for various organisations now. Anyone that's interested in promoting professional pest control. Uh, and that's really a passion of mine, is making sure that people understand pest control, the importance of it, and also how to do it properly and professionally. We've made lots of strides in the industry to make sure pest control has become more professional over the years. Have we got a long way to go? Yes, we absolutely have. And, and, and really the sort of the purpose of today is really to make sure uh, that anyone that's joining us today has a better understanding of, of why we do pest control, um, why is it important to do pest control? We'll run through this very, very simply. We could spend a lot of time speaking about all the different reasons for pest control, but just a bit of an overview of the importance of pest control. And we're going to look at it specifically in regards to the source of standard. So today, hopefully, um, those of you joining today will get a bit of an understanding, a better understanding of what the source order is all about in terms of the pest control elements. And hopefully you'll get some practical tips of how to make sure that your food manufacturing sector uh, your manufacturing business is able to meet the requirements of that standard. And we want to exceed the standards. And originally when I wrote this, I sort of put the word achieve in there. And I think we should be aiming for more than achieving standards. I think we should look at the standard and we should look at how can I really exceed this standard, particularly with something that is so important as pest control. Pest control is a real a real big impact on a business uh, and you only have to pick up the newspapers or, or look online to see some of the stories that you read or see online about where where organizations get pest control wrong pest control makes good news it makes good news stories for people people want to hear about rats running around factories and they want to hear about you know contaminated buildings obviously we don't want that but it makes good newspapers it sells newspapers and it's really important for us to protect our reputations uh, to make sure we do things right. We'll have a questions and answers session at the end if you do have any questions. Um, I don't know everything, uh, but I'll happily have a go at answering some of your questions at, at the end of today's session. So let's see where we're going. Why are we bothering? What's the point? Why do we? Why don't we learn to live alongside these pests? Well, there's, there's numerous reasons. Uh, firstly, it's the diseases that they spread. There are numerous, numerous different diseases and conditions associated with all different types of pests. Uh, you have leptospirosis with, with, with rats, uh, a disease that, if contracted, can be quite significant and can actually be fatal. Uh, flies. Flies are by far the worst in transmitting diseases. We only have to look at mosquitoes and malaria to understand that. Luckily, we don't have that in the UK at the moment, uh, but we do have lots and lots of different species of fly, over 7,000 different types. And these flies are really good at transmitting diseases. They're airborne, they fly, they've got real good suckers on their feet, and they're a real, real breeding ground for bacteria and other pathogens. A recent study looked at some flies and found between one and three million different pathogens on a single house fly. Across the world, flies, house flies in particular, have been recorded as transmitting over 130 different pathogens, salmonella, those kind of things, E. coli. So making sure our premises are kept clear of pests as best as possible has a massive impact on the diseases that may well be spread if we don't control them. Product recall is a big thing in food manufacturing, and you only have to go on the websites of the Food Standards Agency to see product recalls. This was one uh, that I just found on, on the Food Standards Agency website. Uh, and it was some rice with some, I think they, they, were, they, were, they were weevils or, or beetles within the rice. Uh, looking online as well, I was trying to find the average cost of a product recall. Now, obviously, when you get your company's name up in lights in the paper for a food safety issue, that's going to have many, many indirect costs. 
but it's estimated that a, a product recall is going to cost in excess of £30,000, so in some cases much, much more than that. They damage stuff. They damage our buildings. They damage the outside of our properties. This was some pipe work at a food factory that had been attacked by gulls. I'm lucky enough to live down on the tropical south coast of England down in Brighton, uh, and we have plenty of gulls, um, and they can cause considerable damage. They can damage the inside of our building. They can damage our, our, our food, our stuff. This here is a picture of some, some small beetles called biscuit beetles that are bored into this food product here. There are many pieces of legislation uh, that require us to make sure that, that our buildings, any building, is, is, is free from significant pest activity. And we're talking about the food industry today. And of course, the Food Safety Act of 1990 places real responsibilities on us as food manufacturers, as people selling food to the members of the public, that we provide it in a state that is demanded by the purchaser and, and free from contamination, not going to make people ill or sick. We have a duty to our staff. Often this is overlooked. Uh, we, we concentrate on providing safe food for our customers, making sure they're kept safe. But when we run a business, we have a duty to our own staff. We've got to make sure that they are looked after. The Health and Safety at Work Act says we have to provide uh, a safe place of work that's that, that's not going to make people sick. And if, if I was to work in a factory that was full of rats, then is that a safe place for me to be working? Am I at unnecessary risk of catching diseases such as leptospirosis, virus disease? And I think as businesses, we have a real important duty to make sure we keep our staff safe. And not forgetting the fact that these pests actually eat our food, don't they? They eat and contaminate our food. And it's estimated that across the whole world, we lose around 40% of the food that we, we grow and store to pests. And that's with the use of pesticides. Rodents, insects, birds, they contaminate our food as well. A rat may only eat 30, 60 grams of food a day, but how much food may we throw away if we think a rat has been nibbling on just some of the food? And it's often the amount that we think has been contaminated that we throw away that's the more significant amount. And of course, there's the audit process. Uh, today, we're talking about salsa audits, and we do want our businesses to be able to show they are running the right way. The salsa audit helps us to be able to demonstrate that our business is, is run properly, diligently, and that can only place us in a much better place in the market. So we understand why. We understand the need to control these things. What are we going to talk about today? Well, here's some basic principles for you when we're thinking about pest control. The first thing I want to get across today, perhaps, is that proactive is better than reactive. One is better than the other by far. If we can keep pests out of building, and here's a picture of a a brick wall with a, a weep hole that's been covered by, by a vent here. These are classic ways for mice to gain access into buildings. And it's much better, a much better way to be proactive, to keep these things out, rather than to have to run around a factory to try and control them using traps or baits or that kind of thing. Pest control is a team sport. Everyone has a role. Um, it's not like fixing a car. If my car breaks down, someone comes out, they open the bonnet, they replace a part of my car, and I drive the car off. I've had little to do with that. I'm not involved in the process. But when we have pest activity within a building, it's not just the responsibility of the pest controller that you may employ to get rid of that pest. There's lots and lots of other roles that need to happen from people within the factory to make sure pests are controlled. The hygiene team will probably need to do something. Maybe there might be some holes that need filling in. Maybe some processes need reviewing. All of those things need to happen in conjunction with the activities of the pest controller to get a successful result. And we all want the same thing. Everybody, whether you be a pest controller or a food business owner or an auditor or someone enforcing on legislation, we all want the same thing. We all want a situation where we have no pests and we pass the audit. That's the absolute sweet spot of all of this. And it's important sometimes to make sure that we work together to achieve that common goal or to get as close to it as possible. It's not always possible to be pest free, but it is possible in every situation to work further towards controlling the pests further. And we should never get to a situation where we just accept 
oh, we'll always have pests here, so let's not do anything. That's a very dangerous place to be. But it is a game of cat and mouse. And the term integrated pest management is a really interesting and really important concept to understand. This is about using all the available tools that we have to be able to control pests with the least damage to the environment, the least risk to everybody, um, but in the long control or long term as well. And it is a game of cat and mouse. What do I mean by this? The pests are evolving. The pests are changing. Every time we do something in pest control, the pests have a reaction to that. Here's a map of the UK and, and you can get this. Um, you can get this information from the RRAC, uh, the RAC, Rodenticide Resistance Action Committee. So some of the rodenticide, some of the bait that we use is now not successful in the control of mice, for example. So there are some mice, and these are shown on this map uh, with the yellow and the red markings on the map, which you'll see around Exeter, London, Cambridge, Manchester, Liverpool and Edinburgh where certain active ingredients, certain rodenticide, the mice have become resistant to. And this is something that's, that's becoming an increasing, increasing problem. And it's all to do with evolution. The mice are evolving strategies to, to deal with the things that we have previously used to control them. This makes integrated pest management much, much, much more significant uh, because quite simply, we're gonna run out of poison. We're gonna run out of baits. And we need to make sure that we do things to control populations in the long term, seal up holes, manage our waste in a good way, educate our staff, be pest aware. All of these things are necessary now in order to gain successful control of, of pretty much any pest. I was reading an article today in, in a magazine and it was talking about the resistance of some stored product insects, some beetles, to one of the most dangerous chemicals that we use in pest control, phosphine gas. And it was saying some of these beetles have developed resistance to this highly, highly toxic chemical. That to me just goes to show the adaptability of these creatures and how we as a society have got to make sure we use everything we can to try and control. So let's have a look at the SALSA standard. Many of you will be really familiar with this. Um, and we are going to run through the pest control section. Pest control section 1.9. We're going to run through that in some detail. That's the main bit. However, Pest control affects everything we do, really. And skimming through, looking through the audit, if you look in other sections, there are things that link back to pest control. We have some sections that say, hey, look, you've got to have an effective cleaning process. That's critical to good pest control and records should be kept. A thing to note that if your pest controller is visiting your, your premise and finding mouse droppings or rat droppings in area, does that lead back to us saying we have an effective cleaning process? Possibly not. We need good allergen management. Now, pest controllers sometimes use products that may have allergens in them, and it would be sensible as part of your allergen management procedure to have a conversation with your pest controller to make sure they're aware of what allergens can't be brought onto site. Checks on incoming materials. Again, mice, rats, insects don't just come in through open doors and gaps in the building. They sometimes come in on the packaged goods that we bring in to the factory. Have we got robust checks on stuff that's coming in? Do the people that are checking the products coming in know what they're looking for? Some of the signs of pest activity can be not so obvious. Holes in packaging, moth webbing, certain smells, uh, droppings, those kind of things sometimes are not obvious to many people. What about our waste collection? A massive, massive point um, of importance when talking about pest control. Are your bins in the right place? Have you got enough bins? Are they cleaned regularly? Do they have the, the bungs on the bottom of any wheelie bins? Could your waste collection areas really, really be improved to, to deny the attraction to pests to the building? What about documents? Document control is, is, is essential, isn't it, in good food manufacturing, because it shows we're doing the right things. It's part of our traceability. And you've got lots of documents you need to review. What about the pest control documents? Do they need to be re reviewed? Can you sit down and have a conversation with your pest controller to make sure the documents that should be in your pest reporting system are the right type, the right condition, and that they've been reviewed on a regular basis? The perimeter of the outside, again, something really significant in pest control. Now, many of us won't have full control over all of our perimeter area, but have a look at your perimeter area. What more could you do to make it 
an un, uh, uninviting place for pests to be to be around. What about the structure of the building? And again, this comes under the pest control section, but it's also repeated in this in this clause here, 4.4.1, about making sure that all of our fabrication of our building is in good condition and well maintained. And there's lots of reasons for that. There's lots of benefits to doing that kind of work. And finally, glass. Um, we may introduce glass as pest controllers in the form of fly killers. Um, so we should have some form of controls on those. And, and many fly killer tubes are, are come as uh, shatterproof um, so that the, that the glass uh, breakage element is, is controlled. Um, and in fact, many more fly killers these days are being turned over to uh, LED style. So we're actually taking some of the glass out in some situations. Some LEDs still have glass, um, but it's important that your fly killers uh, form part of your, um, your glass uh, unbreakable control procedures. So we can see that although we're going to focus on section 1.9, there are many other sections of the SALSA audit which are applicable when it comes to making sure pest control um, is effective on the site. So let's have a look at the actual standard. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through the standard, introduce each element to, to, to you, and just to make sure that we've got some practical steps that we can use to make sure that uh, we are successful in our, in our SALSA audit and have a less likely uh, building for pests to develop. So the first section is all about the construction and maintenance of, of the building. So this, this very much ties into something we've just spoken about, making sure your building, the pests can't get in. If they can get in, that they're not able to access areas to breed and that the factory is designed in such a way that uh, it's easy to keep clean. Uh, 1.9.2 is all about uh, making sure that the person providing pest control services, so the person specifically tasked with monitoring and controlling pests, is competent to do so, and that the contract that is in place is suitable and sufficient for the activities that are undertaken at the site. The location of all pest monitors shall be on a plan diagram of the site, and this should be reviewed at least annually. This is about making sure we've got controls in place. Many sites will utilize non-toxic monitoring now, which is absolutely the right thing to do if there's no pest activity, but we still should be tracking and tracing where these monitors are going, making sure we've got control over them, which helps us prevent contamination, but also enables us to get good data from the monitors. We can't get good data if we don't know where they are. 1.94 um, says that inspection records should be kept and that activity should be documented. This is all about making sure that, that recommendations are made and good documents are held. 1.9.5, we start to introduce the principles of trend analysis. This is taking an overview of what's going on on the site and trying to come up with plans to target certain areas of the site or certain pest activity. And this is a really important big piece of work uh, that, that, that really needs to be done uh, because it also helps us use our resources in the right way. How do we know if we've been successful if we're not looking at data? And I often talk about football matches when I'm teaching uh, pest control uh, procedures to people. And I say, how do you know if you're winning if you don't record how many goals you score? And in a football match, we, we see that the team that scores the most goals wins. And that gives us data that we can use to analyse whether things are working or not working. 1.96 is about safety, isn't it? It's about making sure that any chemicals we introduce to the, to the factory environment, the food processing environment, we've got records of what they are and all the safety documentation around them. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at these individual uh, clauses and see how we can achieve these or exceed these standard uh, descriptions. Before we do that, let's see where it goes wrong. So this is data that, that SALSA have provided for me, and it's the six, six different, um, different clauses that we've just been through. Uh, and from this, we can see the, the blue uh, columns here represent where a non-conformance has been received, the orange where a corrective is needed uh, before approval, um, a green is a corrective before the next audit, and the yellow column here gives us a, a, a total in that. And this is quite interesting because it we can start to we talked about trends we can start to pick out some trends so if we look here 1.9.3 is by far the largest section isn't it in terms of where people are, are making mistakes in their audit process 
And for me, this is probably the simplest one, I think. Um, it's draw a plan. Draw a plan of where all your monitors are. Sign it off once a year. Make sure it's accurate. Um, and have a key on the plan to show where everything is. Perhaps the most significant when we look at non-conformances, which is the most significant of, of these different columns. So this is where a real, real problem has been, uh, been identified. And, and this, quite ironically, is about trending. You know, this is where we haven't looked at the data for the year, for the month, compared it to the last year. We haven't made any form of kind of statements. Uh, and this can easily be done um, very quickly. It doesn't need to be done by a pest controller. It could be done by an on-site on person. Um, but really, we just need a real headline piece of data to say, where are our problems? Where are we doing well? Where can we improve? What's going well? What's going wrong? What do we need to do? And I'll show you some easy ways to trend data. It doesn't need to be an incredibly detailed process, but it does need to show that we've actually stepped back from the process, looked at the data and come up with some ideas of how we're going to improve or what we're going to continue to do to be in a good position. And the final one, because it's not always about looking at the bad stuff, is it? Uh, the good stuff. So this is the one, 1.9.6, which is our safety documents. Um, these tend to be tend to be the area of the standard where most people are becoming or, or achieving compliance. Uh, and, you know, this is about providing safety data sheets, product labels um, and, and those kind of stuff. So we are we are doing well on that front. So let's have a let's have a bit of a look, see uh, what we can do in terms of breaking this down per per clause. So the, the premise should be designed, constructed and maintained so as to minimize the risk of pest infestation. But this is all about fabrication audits. This is this should be something that is built into uh, any food safe, safety system. Uh, people should be going around the factory, the outside, the inside, looking for damage, looking for areas that can be improved to reduce the risk of pest activity. Um, it should be remembered that a mouse can squeeze through a hole the size of, uh, of a biro, five to six mil. And that's the standard of proofing that we need to exclude rodents. And, and that's quite a, quite a tough ask, isn't it? You know, it's quite difficult to seal up all the holes. But the more holes we seal up, the more proofing we do, the less likely it is that rodents are going to gain access. It's actually a really good time of the year to do this kind of work as well. It's getting colder. Rodent species are going to start looking for, for warmer environments to move into. Um, and now is a very good time to go around the outside of your building and see how many places a rodent could possibly gain entry. Um, pest controllers should be highlighting this. Quite often as a pest controller, um, you're, you're, you're kind of made to feel sometimes that you don't want to bring up recommendations. And certainly it is so important that as a pest controller, we make recommendations and they are just that, they're just recommendations. They are recommendations by people who are looking at buildings from purely a pest control point of view. Um, and it's really important that we make these recommendations as pest controllers and that our clients look at these as well. We're looking for po possible entry points. Uh, we're also looking for improvements that we can make to stop uh, pest harborage developing or to stop effective cleaning that, that, that may, um, may not be able to be achieved. Here we've got um, uh, a wall floor junction here that's recently been repaired. And you can see that's in good condition. It's not going to enable debris to build up or insects to, to, to kind of accumulate in those areas. We want to design our buildings not just to stop pests getting in, but also to make them easy to clean and to try and make it so that there are no areas where pests can kind of hide out the way, stay hidden uh, and eventually cause us some problems. And it's not just about insects. And I apologize for the next picture, um, but uh, they are some cockroaches, I'm afraid. Uh, these are oriental cockroaches. So it's not just about thinking about rats and mice. Obviously, they're hugely significant, but we should also be thinking about designing of buildings, trying to keep insect pests out. One of the easiest and most effective way of doing that is by fitting fly screens to windows that open um, and making sure that we design places so debris doesn't accumulate. So pests, particularly insects, don't have access to, to food. It's important, we've done all this work, we've looked around the outside of our building, we've sealed holes up, we've repaired wall floor junctions, we've done all this fantastic work, can we evidence it? And I think this is really important as well to make sure that we document when we do this kind of work. 
You know, if we filled five holes on the outside of the wall, it's important to write that down somewhere, maybe on the pest control records, maybe on your fabrication audits, but make sure we have a record so we can say, look, this is what we're doing. This is pest control. Pest control is not about simply putting baits and traps down. Pest control is about stopping pests getting access into buildings and designing areas where pests don't feel comfortable to breed. 1.9.2, this is all about competent pest control operatives, uh, pest control staff that are competent and making sure we have uh, a contract, uh, a service agreement in place, which covers the needs of the business. And this can be done by a simple risk assessment. Firstly, making sure any pest controller you employ is competent. Um, recommendations are very good. Speak to people in your network and see where they've had good experience. Uh, if you don't have someone you can speak to, then look out for these symbols. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of the British Pest Control Association, as I am uh, on the executive board. Um, and you can be assured that if you employ a British Pest Control uh, Association member, that they have been uh, checked and they've been audited by a member of the British Pest Control Association team. They'll go out and visit the company, make sure they've got all the right levels of insurance, training, paperwork and that they engage within CPD points. So they're constantly developing their skills. There is another trade association in the pest control sector, the National Pest Technicians Association. They have two levels of accreditation. Um, so their entry level accreditation and their accredited member uh, level of accreditation. Um, so it's the accredited member level accreditation that is, is, is the highest level. Uh, and this is very similar to the BPCA in terms of uh, the companies are audited and checked to make sure that they are doing, doing the right things. Um, we need to make sure that your operative is, is competent as well. So anyone visiting your, your premise should hold as a basic level, an RSPH level two in pest management. This is kind of the entry requirement of all pest controllers um, and anyone working in the food sector should hold this level of qualification. It would be very prudent as well for the pest controller that is visiting your premise to have some kind of food safety training as well. Um, so it's important that they understand what their implication is in being in a food manage, uh, manufacturing setting as well. How many inspections do we need to do? How, how detailed should our contract be? Well, this, this is definitely something um, that is based on risk. And you should definitely get advice from the pest controller. They will be able to recommend to you the level of service that is necessary. And, and there's different aspects to this. So when you're, when you're thinking about this, we should include the follow-up process as well. So when we design a contract, we should perhaps be saying, right, okay, this site is a, is a medium risk. We're going to visit this eight times per year. Um, and that's fine. That's great. But what are we going to do if we find mouse activity inside? Does that then lead on to some follow up processes? What is the follow up process on you in, in your site? Because if we simply react in the same way when we find no activity, when we find mouse activity or pest activity, that, 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 that doesn't feel right. We should be doing enhanced visits, enhanced treatments if we've got an active pest activity that needs to be treated. The types of pests that are on your premise as well, or types of pests that you are potentially liable to come into contact with uh, are important to review as well. Um, here we have, this is an Indian meal moth. Um, and these, these moths particularly favor things like dried fruits and cereals and rice and those kind of things. Has your contract considered all of the aspects that it needs to think about? Many of those, those, those aspects uh, I'm going to show you an example in a minute, but those aspects should be documented. We should have a document somewhere that says we've looked at all these different factors and this is why we've come up with the service frequency that we've got. So things that affect how many visits, what type of pest control you need will depend on your location. City centre areas may be much more prone to mouse activity. Um, the condition of the building. Is it a new build? Is it purpose built? Have you converted something? What about the products that you use on site? What products do you hold? Um, obviously, if you've got dried fruit and cereals, that you're going to need to have some kind of stored product insects, such as this Indian meal moth kind of monitoring in place. What processes do you have? Do you use a lot of water, a lot of steam, a lot of heat, a lot of cold? All of these things are going to have an influence on the type of pest control you need, as well as your history. 
you know, if we've got a year's worth of data saying we've, we've had mice every month for the last 12 months, then, you know, that's going to influence or should influence the level of service that we need to provide in future years. Uh, here is an example. So this is this is a very basic example of a pest risk assessment. So in this particular environment uh, example, uh, the current specification was was examined. This site received 12 inspections uh, for rodents and crawling insects. Um, they had EFK servicing uh, and there's one biologist visit uh, and the, the site was actually moving towards the source of standard. So the, the following risk assessment was, was created to make sure their contract was right for them, make sure they had the right specification in place. Here we looked at the existing environmental conditions, which may be conducive to pest activity, and we gave it a score, high, medium or low, very basic, very simple. Condition of the building, again, the building was in a good standard, so we gave it a low score. Attraction from clients' operation, including the materials that they had. Well, this was a small scale bakery. Yes, there was some high risk stuff there, but it was in such small amounts that we gave it a low score. Again, these are quite subjective things. The products on site, which will enable pest infestation to develop, again, a bakery with low volumes, we gave it a medium. And we look back at the history. Well, for this particular site, the records weren't very good for the last 12 months. So with that being said, we decided to give it a high risk because we weren't confident that the records were accurate. We noted that there was no seasonal variation in, in, in the site. And we came up with a, with a score of nine here, a medium risk. So we gave it a medium risk here. And we looked upon the contract and we said, look, is this contract that they have at the moment, is it suitable for their business? And we, we said, yes, it was. The current frequency of service is adequate to meet the needs of the site. We found a few slight improvements that could be made, um, such as these that were detailed here, minor improvements to the contract. But in essence, we've got now got a document that's looked at the risk of the site, looked at the current specification, and has said, do you know what? The specification that you've got is right for your business. And that should be done each year. Each year, that risk assessment should be done um, and we should come up with it with an answer to whether or not the specification we've got is right, right for the business. 1.9.3, remember this is this is the area where, where most businesses uh, or the majority of non-conformances come from. Um, and as I said before, I, I, I think this is quite a simple one really. Um, so here's a map of Paul's Pasta Factory. It's not a real place, I, I made this up for illustrative purposes. And on this map, you can see I've got a, a title, I've got a date, I've signed it, I've got a key for all of the different apparatus that are on site, the red are internal rodent monitors, the blue are fly killers, the, uh, the, the yellow are crawling insect monitors, uh, the hashed yellow ones are moth monitors, and the green ones are external rodent monitors. Now, there's no there's no law, there's no rule to say what color to, that you should use for each individual monitoring point, but those are the colors you should use for all the individual monitoring points. The insect monitors should be yellow, the outside ones should be green, the inside rodents should be red, and the fly killers should be blue. It's just the way things should be. That's my personal opinion, but that's the way things should be. But the monitoring plan should record all of the monitors. They should all be numbered so that we can trace them, we can track them. And as you'll see a bit later on from this, we will be able to record uh, some trends and gather some information. That's as simple or as complicated as a site plan needs to be. 1.9.4, inspections should be at regular intervals. We should keep records, including details of pest activity. Uh, we should be looking at recommendations as well from the pest controller. One way to help ensure that your pest control service is spread nice and evenly across the year is to come up with week commencing dates, to, to, to their sort of target dates to mean that the pest control visits are spread across the year. That's often a good, uh, a good thing to have in place to help planning from both the pest controller and the site. Uh, we should be given reports by our pest controllers with detailed recommendations on them. And it's important that we in the, we as pest uh, pest controllers, and it's important uh, as people that are running through manufacturing facilities, that we actually read these documents. Uh, so often, uh, and I'm incredibly guilty of this, we take a document, we file it, and, and we don't actually look at that. Um, and it's important to document the actions taken. Uh, and in most pest uh, pest control reporting systems, there's space on the documents, whether that be a, a physical piece of paper 
or an online system, there's spaces for us to record the actions that we've taken, annotate these things, write things down. One of the things that I get fed back from auditors quite a lot is that the documents are provided by the pest controller and it might say, please seal this wall, uh, this hole in this wall. Uh, and, and there's no record of any actions being taken on the pest management documents. And it's important that we make sure that we make recommendations and we, and we, we, uh, we fill out the actions that we've actually undertaken. We need to be careful with our online reporting as well. We need to make sure if you do receive online reports that these are actioned and that access can be gained to this system easily and that you know how to navigate through your portal as well, making sure that you can access the information. A key point, I think, is, is, is really to think about, can you show that your business is taking actions to control pests? As I said at the start, this is a team sport. If we simply place all the requirements onto the pest controller, then I think we are, we are not doing pest control properly. We all have a role to play, and it's important that we can provide evidence to show what have we done? Have we trained our staff? Have we sealed some holes? Have we reviewed our cleaning process? Have we looked at our outside perimeters? What have we done? to make our building, um, you know, sort of a, an environment that pests don't want to be in. Hygiene, housekeeping, proofing, education. Um, trending is an important thing, um, and this should be done at least annually. Um, and where trends are identified, we should put corrective actions in place. I'm going to go through this to a very simple level. But do you remember my map from Paul's Pasta Factory? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you also remember the colours that you should be using, because they should be those colours. Um, and from this, you'll see that there should be 24 red circles, 24 red circles, they're internal rodent monitors. Um, and what I've done here is I've created a checklist. So here you'll see the numbers one to 24. This is the location of the baits. And for each month of the year, the pest controller has recorded whether there's been no pest activity, i.e. a zero, or there's been mouse activity, i.e. a one. If we do this very, very simple trending, we should be able to bring out some information from this. Let's see what we can bring out. This is made up data. I've just made this up to illustrate a point. So if we um, put this data together and we simply sum up each individual bait, we should be able to identify a trend. So using some very basic functions in Excel, conditional formatting, highlight the cells, press conditional formatting, and it will make these fancy colors here with green being the lowest number and red being the highest number. And what that enables us to do really, really quickly and simply is to say to ourselves, where is the most problematic area of our factory? Paul's pasta factory has a problem. I think you've probably all guessed it in the ingredient store. There is a problem in the ingredient store. So it would be sensible for us now to write a plan or enact a plan that targets the ingredient store. That's the best use of our resources. You know, if we've only got one handyman to seal up the holes, let's not send him to the chilled finished goods because the mouse activity there is not as significant as it is in the ingredient store. That's our area of highest risk. We could do further trending. Let's take this. Uh, uh, Another, another angle, we can add up simply by adding up all the, the positive scores we've got here, um, all the activity per month. And from here, we will be able to tell that at the start of the year, we were doing well, into the summer, we were doing well, and then something started to go wrong. Something started to go wrong. And this is where trending becomes really, really important because we need to be self-reflective here and say, we were doing well, we're not doing so well now, What's changed? What's caused this? Why have we suddenly gone from an environment where we had virtually no mouse activity to an environment where we've got considerable mouse activity? We can take this even further, can't we? We could look at last year's data. We could look at 2021's data. And we could say, OK, is this, is this something that happens every year? Is this sort of a normal thing? Well, no, it's not in our data. We've looked at 2021. We had no problems in 2021. Um, and they've, they've, they've definitely got worse. So what is it that's caused that? And this is really what where trending adds its value. What's happened? What's changed? What can we do about it? And the actions that we take, were they successful? And we only know if they're successful if we keep score. So if we continue to monitor, hopefully we should see that number of 18 go back down to the number of one, twos and threes that we got in the previous year. Trending doesn't need to be difficult. 
However, it's important that we do it to reflect, to plan, to make sure our plans are effective and um, are, are, are being kept up to date. A simple way to do trend analysis as well, so that was a way of doing rodent analysis, is to do EFK, electronic fly killer catch tray analysis. If you've got fly killers on your site, this is a really simple and easy way to collect some data that you can, you can draw some trends from. Most of the time this is done on a quarterly basis. Sometimes it's better to do this more frequently, but certainly on a quarterly basis, we'll start to give you some good data. And what you do is you simply look at the fly killing unit, this is normally done by the pest control professionals. Um, they'll look in the fly killer. They'll say, OK, you've got some moths, you've got some beetles, you've got some big flies, some little flies, some wasps, that kind of stuff. Uh, and they'll count them up. And what they'll do is in conjunction with yourselves, they'll, they'll establish a limit, um, an acceptable limit. Now, this is a difficult thing to come up with. Um, and perhaps looking back over previous data is a, is a good way of doing this. But we want to establish a limit that we think is, it's not necessarily we're accepting, but is normal. What's the normal expectation for this fly killer? Um, and you might decide to set it 100 flies, 100 flies. If it's above 100 flies, then we have an issue. If it's below 100 flies, then great, fantastic. The processes, procedures we got in place are working. If it goes above the limit, then we've identified a problem. We've identified something that is needed to change. We ask ourselves some basic, simple questions. What, what's caused it? Why has this fly level gone up? It may be that a door's broken. It may be uh, that the, the cleaning hasn't been done uh, so effectively. It, it may be just that we're in the warmer months of the year and we expect a higher count. What can we do about it? Well, can we fix the door? Can we change the housekeeping? Can we look at ways to minimize the areas in which flying insects breed? And then we ask ourselves on the next quarter, did it work? Have we managed to bring that level down? Have we been successful? Have we identified a, a break um, above our critical control limit? Have we identified what we're gonna do about it? And did it work? If it did, fantastic. If it didn't, we go back to the start. What caused it? What we're gonna do about it? How do we work? Without this trending, we are missing opportunities to improve pest control based on data within our food manufacturing areas. Very, very important thing. And according to, to the figures, an area where sometimes we, we fall down, and I think we fall down because we think it needs to be more complicated than it is. We think this needs to have some huge amount of statistical analysis. And yeah, great if we can do that. But I think on a very basic level, it's a very simple thing to do and gives us good direction about where our pest control needs to go or how successful it's been. The last one, baits and other materials. Um, such as sprays, fumigants should be applied according to the, to the documentation, which shall be held on site. So here we're talking product labels. All pesticides have a product label. This tells the person using the pesticide how to use it. All of these are actually on the products that, that we use as pest controllers, but this is the document that will tell us how to use it, at what dose, uh, where to use it, et cetera. The safety data sheet, uh, these are often held by, by organizations. These provide all the background information, the science that sits behind all the pesticides, tells us what to do if we get it in our eyes, tells us how to dispose of the product, et cetera. And quite often it's good to have a copy of the pest controller's cost assessment. This is a, this is a more usable document um, that shows how we're gonna control and mitigate all the risks that are associated with using chemicals. So any of these documents um, will, will be useful but they need to be reviewed, reviewed on a regular basis. Um, these things do change quite regularly and keeping up to date with them is, is quite, quite difficult to do sometimes, particularly the safety data sheets. Um, so it's important that a, a periodic review is done of these things um, so that they're available and that they can be used in the case of an emergency or in the case of review when, when looking at these different chemicals. For some questions, if people do have any questions, um, Hopefully you've managed to get something from that. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, you can either write it in the chat box or if you'd like to raise your hand um, virtually, um, we can um, we can answer it then. Is a, um, uh, we've got salsa consultancy, regular consultancy, just as, as an aside, but we also use a very um, respected um, um, pest control company Mm -hmm. And an issue we've had recently is 
is everything's been fine but we've recently had a funny situation where we, we've got a problem with mice we've always had that problem it's been under control but recently it appears that the mice have got clever and uh, and uh, getting round the uh, the tracks that are in place so i have i have contacted the consultancy melford and asked them to come in and check it out but if all they're going to do is put more of the same in what should how should i deal with them how should i get them to escalate or change the procedures that they're doing yeah so you, you've touched on a really good point there paul that the mice are getting cleverer uh, and this is a really interesting uh, behavior in mice it's, a, it's something called behavioral resistance so it's it's basically a, a, an organism uh, finding ways to circumnavigate the things that control it so it's, it's evolution at the end of the day that's, that's occurring. And because mice breed so, so quickly, these levels of, uh, of, of bait avoidance that you're seeing, behavioral resistance, can happen really, really quite quickly. Um, in terms of challenging your pest management company, I, I would certainly make sure that your, your views are clear to them and to say, look, what else can we do? There are many, 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 many things that pest controllers can do in terms of managing behavioral resistance. So um, if they're using toxic bait, it might be they need to change the formulation of the bait, so i.e. how it's presented. It may be that a change in active ingredient is necessary to make the bait more palatable to the mouse. It may be that a different container can be used. It may be the container that the mouse has become wary of. Um, so maybe switching how the bait is applied is another thing that your pest manager can do. Uh, making sure that the pest manager is challenging you as well onto things like your proofing, your hygiene, your housekeeping, all those things are important. Different types of traps can be used. Um, there is a huge range of different traps that can be used with different baits in different positions. And what you really want from your pest manager is someone who's going to think around problems. If your pest management company is simply coming in, opening the bait boxes, putting a tick in a box and then saying, yeah, you've got some mice, see you next time, then that is not professional pest control. That is that is the old school way of doing pest control. So um, go back to your pest controller, challenge them on what they're doing, ask them what their behavioral resistance strategy is, see what other things they can do, ask them what you need to be doing as well, come together as a team on this and just make sure that um, everyone is doing their bit on it, but really go back and challenging them. Um, and unfortunately, there are great pest management companies out there. There are some that are not so good, um, but it is about the individual that walks through your door. So how is how motivated is that pest controller? Um, and perhaps, you know, understanding, uh, making them realize that you are involved in this and want, want this to, 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 to be solved is also another thing. Quite often I've gone to places myself as a pest controller and I've kind of been left with the opinion that the client's not really that interested. So if the client's not interested, my level of motivation, you know, would, would go down. Um, so making sure they understand your concerns as well is, is really important. And if you're not getting the support from them, uh, escalate it through that organization. Um, and then if you're still not getting the level of support, uh, there are many other pest management companies who would who would love to come and service your site. So uh, contact the British Pest Control Association. They can put you in touch with with other members in your area. Uh, but I think it's important to go back through your pest control provider at this stage to make sure they understand your concerns. OK, just one more follow up question, if it's OK. Should um should I because we've now got monthly um, salsa consultancy you know so we've got the maintenance agreement to keep us always salsa compliant yeah should i go through my salsa consultants or should i still deal with directly with the pest people about the, an issue like this um so i would maintain contact with your pest management company because you you and they are the people that need to make sure that there's there's plans in place um, um so I, I would liaise directly with the pest management company I, I don't know sarah whether you want to come in with a salsa view on that uh but i certainly would, would think along those lines okay that's, i mean that is what i've done so far yeah okay um so i come in there sarah Yes, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. So this is um, Sarah Hall, our certification manager. Who does oh, the yeah. Um, I would agree with with what Paul um, Paul Westgate is saying. 
is that yes um stay in contact with your pest controller you, you want to be on this it's not something that you want to wait until a, until your soul cement is going to come and visit um if you've got a problem identified then let's get sorting it out now not waiting okay yeah well, i've done that actually as it happens but i was making sure i was doing the right actions okay all right, great. Thank you, Paul, for that question. That was a, that was a really useful useful question. Well, as as I mentioned before, if you think of a question after this, do do um, email us info at salsafood.co.uk, and we'll do our best to answer the question or pass it on to Paul. Um, this um, webinar has been recorded, and it will be available to for for our members and other participants to, to view so we'll be sending that out to everybody that's attended today and it will also be available on our website in the next couple of days um thank you paul so much we have all learned so much today the salsa team included your your support and help has been been great and i know that everyone um, that's on the webinar today has, has really enjoyed this this webinar it's very interesting so thank you oh, absolutely welcome and always happy to help out where i can